The social distancing rules, one of the measures uh, to containing the spread of COVID-19. He earlier today held a teleconference with members of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 over response efforts at the State House Abuja. Of course, the President is staying safe while working. And while the global figures of confirmed cases from the coronavirus surges past 2 million mark, according to the Johns Hopkins University uh, COVID-19 Resource Center, that is, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control puts the total number in the country at 373. According to the NCDC, the breakdown of the states show Lagos with 214 cases, the FCT Abuja with 58, or Shu has 20 cases. In the meantime, Kano State has a total of nine Nine confirmed cases after announcing today uh, five new cases in the state. The Federal Capital Territory earlier today as well announced uh, nine more COVID-19 patients discharged from the FCT isolation center. And just in, in Lagos, the total of 16 patients have been discharged of that number, 14 are male, two females and three foreigners. So hopefully we might see a change in the numbers uh, from the NCDC to reflect uh, the changes in some of the states. Now, Suzanne Idoko, the lady who has been in the Abuja Isolation Centre on reference from the Benue State Government, has been narrating her ordeal since she was kept there. In an exclusive interview with our correspondent, uh, Friday Kirigwe, she insists that she is well. Uh, she doesn't think she's uh, COVID-19 positive and is asking government to release her to go back to London where she resides. Let, let me just quickly tell you what the minister said. Okay. The minister uh, said that um, you tested positive and uh, that is the reason why you are in the isolation center. That is a lie. So how many tests have they, have they carried out on you? They did one, a kangaroo one in Makodi, which I got, the, I told the minister until I get that result, nobody's going to do another test on me because they've announced me in the press already without my knowledge. I came from London on the 22nd of March. The hospital told me that because I'm coming from a high-risk area, that the standard procedure was then to call uh, the State Ministry of Health or blah, 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 to do a test. And innocently, I said, yes, I don't mind. Come and do a test on me. Will you ever show the result at all? No. I said the result, the photocopies of the result were brought to me. I mean, the purported result or the supposed result, because I told the Minister of Health that if I don't have a result, nobody does a test on me, I'm not going to accept it. So I had three letters with me, one of the results, one letter with different dates, different bed dates. They brought it on the 8th here in Abuja, because I was transferred from Makadi on the 2nd of April to Abuja with an ambulance and armed men. Altogether, how many mm -hmm. tests did they carry out on you? They did one in Makodi and they, on the tenth year they came and did they did another swap here on the tenth. So two tests? Yes. Did they show it to you? No. I just had doctors came in on Sunday and say, Madam, you are you are you are positive. From Makodi till this place I've not taken a dose of Panadol, not one Panadol from anybody as I speak to you. What kind of treatments have you been receiving? <laughs> For the past 22 days, sir, apart from when I went to the hospital and they said they gave me a digestic for pain relief from the doctors, that's the private hospital I went to in Makodi. Since Benue State Government took me to isolation and I'm here in isolation in Abuja till now, I have not taken a Panadol from anybody. I'm just inside my room. I'm not allowed to come out. Uh, if I come, if I peep outside to ask for anything, Madam, go inside, go inside. The doctors come every day to come and ask of my welfare and tell me, do I want to take the first time I on, on the third, the doctor came in and said, oh, uh, we've come, they suggested that we give you malaria treatment because we are coming from a place where there's no malaria and Nigeria, there's malaria. I said, but I thought they brought me here for COVID. Why malaria now? I don't want any malaria treatment.
The following day, another doctor came in and said, Oh, we are going to treat you for mild symptoms. I said, what's mild symptoms? What? I don't have any symptoms. My vital statistics are okay. So, my breathing is okay. I don't have a temperature. So, what are you treating me for? I do not want to take any tablet from anybody because I don't trust Nigerians. Do you have access to, to your family members? Yes. I talk to them on phone. In Makwadi, I was allowed to see my elder brother who comes in to stay with me every day, almost every day. But here, I have, uh, I mean, I'm not allowed to go out. What yeah. exactly do you want, as we speak? I am not sick. I'm being held here. I'm being here. I want to get out. I came for my mom's burial, but because of the lockdown, it's been postponed. If the burial is not hold, let me go and meet my children in London. I am not sick. In the meantime, the Minister of Health during a press conference yesterday said that uh, Ms. Sidoku can only go home when the results come out negative. Well, let's go over to um, the United Kingdom where Dr. Bin Aligwe Kwe, a registrar, Emergency Department London, joins us now via Skype. Thank you for joining us at this time. I'd like to get your thoughts on perhaps the protocol on face mask usage. We now have in Nigeria a comprehensive guideline as to uh, face mask. But what is the protocol there in the United Kingdom? Uh, thank you very much um, for having me once again. Good evening, everyone. Um, basically, there's been a lot of uh, different protocols regarding face masks so all over uh, countries uh, around the globe regarding this um, COVID-19. Um, for now, the, the protocol in the United Kingdom is face masks are only to be used by patients who are confirmed positive and for healthcare workers. Um, basically, that is um, that's based on the assumption that um, based on the, the the strong assumption that uh, COVID, uh, uh, the coronavirus, uh, the causative agents for COVID nineteen, is not airborne as at the last time uh, uh, the WHO informed the whole world. Um, yes, it is. Um, we de we tend to see people using face masks, healthy people using face masks, uh, going about their day to day activities. Uh, but the economics of it uh, tends to suggest that um, when people use it relentlessly, it tends to make it scarce when it is going to be actually needed. A, and that is for patients who are already positive to prevent them from spreading the infection via droplets. And B, for um, healthcare workers for, to protect themselves when seeing patients and also to protect other patients as well. So basically, the protocol is um, basically for healthcare workers and for patients who are positive as at this time. But now we're hearing that the UK is recording more new cases of the virus and London is having the highest number of deaths compared to other areas. Um, why do you think this is so? Um... The thing is, like I, I, I said the last time, this, this, uh, the, the, disease, the, the, the pandemic is peaking at different phases in different countries. Uh, China, it started with China. Um, China has had its own peak. Italy seems to be having its own peak. And the United Kingdom seems to be approaching its own peak. So it's only logical for there to be a rise in new cases. And if you follow the pattern of disease and pattern of pandemics, it only follows that the commercial and political capitals of any nation that is affected will naturally be the worst hit. In the United States, you have the New York, which is the commercial capital, which you can say is the big, largest city in, in America. In Nigeria, of course, it also follows Lagos, the commercial capital, is the, is the, is the most hit. So, I mean, going by the logic of extrapolation, it is not unexpected that London will have the highest number of, um, of uh, incidents and, of course, logically, the highest number of uh, fatalities. The same thing with uh, 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 Russia, with Moscow, you know, um, yeah, that's basically, it's, it's just a natural projection of events. The more populated a city is, the more active, the more economic activity you have there, the more likely it's going to be 
uh, the recipient of um, 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 sufferers of this pandemic. All right, Dr. Bin Ali Gekwe, Registrar, Emergency Department, London. Thank you for joining us at this time. Thank you. Bye bye. Still to come on our COVID-19 updates. How prepared are states to handling the pandemic in Nigeria? We speak to a professor who joins us on the program to join us again. Welcome back. The Commissioner of Police, Interpol, Gareth Baba, says its unit is on the verge of apprehending an eight-man syndicate alleged to have coordinated a fraudulent face mask purchase from Spain. He said it involves a bank transfer to Ireland, which involved 52 lorries and a police escort to transport the masks from a warehouse in the Netherlands to its final destination, that's Germany. Now, how this affects Nigeria is that the supposed account owner originates from Nigeria. The initiators of the deal claim that 10 million masks were available for delivery, but later an initial delivery of 1.5 million masks was made in exchange for an upfront payment of 1.5 million euros. The buyer sent, an, a, sent in a wire transfer of about 880,000 euros, which was required to secure the merchandise but well, the masks never arrived. In a telephone conversation with Mr. Baba, it is an eight-man syndicate and they are working hard to apprehend them. He also says that they operate in Canada, the U.S. and some parts of Europe and usually their final destination is Nigeria. Also, the Inspector General of Police says the full weight of the law will be applied on any transporter who flouts the stay-at-home order. This warning has become necessary, according to him, following information that transporters beat the existing restriction order by resorting to night travels. Mr. Damu further directs that all commissioners of police to ensure the full implementation of the order. Now, states across the country continue to adopt more measures on preventing the spread of COVID-19 in their states. While some are increasing isolation capacities, others are providing more packages to cushion the effect of the lockdown. We begin in Anambra State, where security agencies are enforcing the lockdown compliance in Oka, the state capital, on each other, the commercial hub. All businesses there appear to have closed, uh, while vehicles allowed on the road are those carrying essentials. Enforcing the compliance in the state, the sector commander, FRSC, Mr. Andrew Kumapai, says a total of 85% compliance level has been achieved. In Ogun State, the government in a statement today said a molecular laboratory would be unveiled during the lockdown period at the Olabisi Onobanjo University, Shigamu, where finishing touches, he says, are being put in place. The governor said it will minimize the test turnaround time, which currently is between three to five days, and fast track the handling of positive cases. Elsewhere in Jigawa, the federal government has concluded plans to produce 12 million of 50 kilogram bags of fertilizers in order to make it available to farmers. Also, a subsidized price of 500 naira from 5,500 to 5,000 is being made as part of the palliatives for farmers. Gombe State has no record of COVID-19, yet the governor, Mohamed Yahya, says over 200 million naira has been spent for the procurement of medical supplies and consumables in preparation for a possible outbreak. He also reveals that a molecular testing laboratory is in the offing. He was speaking during a statewide broadcast on measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. A COVID-19 positive patient has been discharged from the Infectious Disease Center in Kaduna State. The Commissioner for Health, Dr. Amina Baloni, who confirmed this in a statement, says the patient has fully recovered after treatment at the isolation center. According to the Commissioner, the state government is looking forward to the recovery and discharge of the other five COVID-19 patients in the state. Finally, the Cross River State Government has begun the disbursement of 239,900,000 naira from the federal government to vulnerable across the state. The disbursement covers over 500 households across 30 communities there. This followed the announcement by the president for the conditional cash transfer of 20,000 naira per household.
Well, joining us for more to dissect the issue of the growing pandemic is Professor Kenneth Ozioilo, uh, President, Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria. I'd like to welcome you to the program. Um, tell us, looking at the extent of the virus spread, as it stands now, do you think that every state in Nigeria is prepared for the fight? Well, thank you and good evening. Um, our membership is spread across the country and uh, we have fillers from different um, parts of the country. Now, apart from perhaps the Lagos state government, um, the information we are getting is that um, the level of preparedness is um, far from ideal. Uh, what is happening in Lagos needs to be commended and recommended for emulation by all. Uh, frontline medical personnel in different medical facilities across the country um, have reported to us a severe shortage of um, uh, personal protective equipment, um, other barriers, you know, to prevent them from contracting this um, virus should patients with it present. And um, also, apart from one or two states, we're not um, getting reports of uh, uh, adequate isolation centers. Uh, we believe that this um, is uh, an opportunity to be seized, you know, in trying to make sure that these centers are put in place. And not just put in place, but also made um, functional. Uh, because it's not just a holding area for patients. It's also supposed to be a treatment area. And it has to be made sanitary and comfortable and adequately manned and staffed to prevent such um, reports as people escaping from um, these uh, places because of um, lack of comfort or other issues. And so even in the states that are not yet hit or that have not reported any incidents of this um, disease, we think that this is a window of opportunity. And even among those that have um, recorded cases, uh, we're not quite happy with the level of um, preparedness. And uh, we think that uh, greater efforts need to be put in place to ensure that these things are in place. And then, you know, ultimately the protection of lives of not just the patients, but the frontline medical personnel who must necessarily care for them when they arrive. Uh, quickly tell us, because activities of public health workforce is to detect, test, admit, and trace contacts. And, you know, with the face, you've commended the Lagos state, but they're also recording um, a higher number than other cases. Does that mean that they are effectively contact tracing and the others aren't? Um, it's, it's, it's very likely, you know, but just like has been highlighted a few minutes ago in your broadcast, you know, uh, major commercial capitals are likely to have more reports of these um, incidents. And Lagos is a major hub in the country, and uh, it is uh, totally understandable that it seems to be having more caseloads. The volume of traffic in and out of Lagos, you know, um, it far exceeds that of the rest of the country. But having said that, there are other factors also. And one area that we are very, very concerned about is the level of testing. Yes, we have increased the capacity for testing, but if you compare um, how much we've tested to other uh, countries, especially in Africa, like South Africa and even Ghana nearby, Relative to our population, we have not really uh, gone very far. I think as of today, we've probably tested about um, 5,000 or thereabouts. And for a population of over 200 million people, perhaps, that figure is low. So there is every likelihood that even in the states where we're reporting no um, uh, figures, it is likely that with increased testing, we're likely to have more figures. And we believe that this capacity for testing, yes, has been expanded, but it needs to be further expanded. And uh, let us not forget that we tend to over-concentrate in the major capitals. But uh, as a minimum, every state capital should be able to test, uh, bearing in mind that some um, locations have no, some regions have no testing capacity at all. And so right. we cannot assume that we do not have enough or that we do not have cases in those areas, uh, it's just more correct to say that um, uh, none has been reported. And this has a lot to do with testing. We'd like to appreciate your time, Professor Kenneth Ozoilo, President, Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria. Thank you for joining us at this time. Thank you for having me.
Another day and another grim statistic as the number of confirmed cases across the world reaches 2 million. That development comes less than two weeks since the world reached a million confirmed cases. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump has been heavily criticized for halting funding for the World Health Organization amid the global virus pandemic. The WHO chief Tedros Ghebreyesus has voiced his regret at the U.S. decision to halt funding. Indeed, to get the comprehensive guidelines on the use of face masks in Nigeria, the NTDC has live updates, health advisory to Nigerians on the coronavirus disease pandemic. Also, the World Health Organization is live for you. Uh, their strategy is on their website to guiding the public health response at both national and subnational levels. That's our program at this time. Thank you for watching. Another update comes your way at 9 p.m. I'm Melissa Antwonwoka. Stay home, stay safe.